good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani, and I'm the former dean <laughs> of the Lee Kuan Yew School of oh. <laughs> uh, Public Policy, and I'm very, very happy uh, to be back here uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School. I think my 13 years as dean uh, were some of the happiest years of my life, and it's always very good to come back to an institution that you loved and cherished uh, and worked with, and such a pleasure uh, to be back here. And I, would, of course, want to thank uh, my two fellow uh, members on the panel, Parak Khanna and Yun Fung Kong, uh, to invite me to join you for this occasion. Uh, fortunately, I have a very easy job. Uh, all I have to do is to introduce uh, the, the guest of honor, the main speaker of the event, uh, Parak Khanna, and I'm going to shock you by making three points <laughs> uh, about him. The, the three points about him is, number one, he's an amazing author. You know, I write books too, right? And those of you who write books, you know what a struggle it is to produce one book? And he just produces a book every few months. <laughs> the latest one, of course, the one we're going to discuss is The Future is Asian. But, you know, he's had so many books. Uh, he had the trilogy that, uh, on the future world order, beginning with Second World Empires and Influence, followed by How to Run the World, uh, and then, of course, concluding with connect Connectography. And each of these books, by the way, and I have them, are massive books. And you sort of wonder how someone can produce so many books in such a short time. Parak, I think you're going to set a world record uh, for the number of books produced. And that's not all. There were many books uh, uh, before that. The second point about Parak is that uh, he's also achieved, at a very young age, I must say, uh, global recognition. So wherever you go around the world, you'll find his name uh, uh, being mentioned. So it's not surprising that in 2008, he was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century and featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. And of course, his global recognition also extends to being invited to being an advisor to the US National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2030 program. And of course, he was also a fellow uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School, a senior, uh, a research, senior research fellow at the, at the Center on Asian Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, when I was the dean here. And, but the third point about Parak is, of course, the most interesting one. Because most Singaporeans expect that people who love books and who spend time with books are, are obviously bookworms. They're nerds, they sit at home and they just read and write. And instead, you have in Parak, and I don't know how he does this, he's also an accomplished adventurer who has traveled to more than 100 countries on all continents. And some of his lengthy journeys, including driving from the Baltic Sea through the Balkans and across Turkey and the Caucasus to the Caspian Sea, that's one, and then across the rugged terrain of Tibet and Xinjiang provinces in western China. And he's also traveled 10,000 kilometers from London to Lanbata in the Mongolia, Mongolian Charity Rally. He has climbed numerous 20,000 foot plus peaks and tracked in the Alps, Himalayas, and Tian Shan mountain ranges. And in between all that, he writes books. So you can see what a remarkable guy is. So Parat, over to you. Thank you so much, Kishore. I should just let you give this talk. And uh, it's, it's really an honor to be here. As we entered this room, it occurred to me that this is actually the first, uh, this is the lecture hall where I gave my first uh, talk when I uh, arrived here in Singapore in 2012 and uh, did a lecture series that fall. And in fact, it was uh, Kanti who had hosted a lecture then. And the, the Lee Kuan Yew School is not only all over this book in terms of being within it and the support of the school from day one. The first time I was a fellow here was actually in the year 2006, in the summer of 2006, when I was researching the Second World. And that was at the invitation of Kishore. So that gives you some indication of how far back we go. In fact, we first met in the year 2000, 2001. So we're coming up on 20 years that 
Jet Kishore has been a big influence on my life and my writing. And as, as many people know, we are looking at the 20th anniversary of his book, uh, Can Asians Think? Um, and since I know that's going to come up in our conversation, I'm not going to say more about it. But that also is mentioned uh, uh, in the book. So uh, Conti, the Center on Asian Globalization, have been uh, very integral to the support for this book financially. The, the, the graduate students in the school have been an immense support uh, for the research here. And I uh, even talk about the flagship journal, um, Global is Asian, uh, in this book. Of course, what better name, in fact, for, uh, for, a, for, for, a, for, a, for a newsletter or a publication. Had they not taken it, perhaps that would have become the title of this book, uh, in fact. And uh, Yuan Feng, I remember uh, stepping in a couple of years ago for the launch of my last book, actually, um, and uh, did so very uh, deftly. And I really appreciate that and look forward to your comments and responses this evening. Given the number of, uh, of friends and uh, brilliant minds, a uh, number of whom are also acknowledged uh, in the book uh, who are here this evening, I know we're going to have a very uh, stimulating conversation, maybe even a bit of a debate, uh, as we well should. So I'm going to keep my points relatively brief. A lot of the graphics and maps that I uh, am going to show you tonight and might just skip over some, really, uh, are in the book in any case. I just want to make a few macro points that will help to kick off the conversation. Um, you know, I like to think that actually uh, a book like this and even the previous one could not have been written had I not moved to Singapore. You know, the perspective that you get not only being in Asia, but being in a city-state in Asia has shaped my thinking on both cities and, of course, the geopolitics of Asia and the way in which the Asian system, as I call it, is taking shape. So let me... Um, because there are a number of students here, I, I, I don't want to bore everyone else with, with theory, but the, 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 the point of departure for this book is very much rooted in international relations theory. And we use this word system. I acknowledge right up front in the book uh, uh, Professor Barry Buzan. He was my uh, earliest thesis advisor at the LSE, and he's a pioneer of the idea of systems uh, theory and systems uh, analysis in international relations. And the system is defined as a set of countries that have more intense interactions with each other than with countries or units outside of their region. And Asia, of course, has not been a system in, uh, in anyone's recent memory, right, because of 500 years of colonialism and the Cold War. So the premise of this book is, that, is to ask the question, is Asia once again becoming a system? Now, there were periods in history when Asia was a system. When we use the term Silk Roads, we hearken back to periods of time 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, again, pre-colonialism, uh, when Asians had, um, had a robust uh, interactions with each other across vast distances. But of course, no one alive today can remember those periods of time, and so we've forgotten uh, that there was once an Asian system and the ways in which that system is um, is being recovered. And this is obviously of great significance because we're talking about the, the region of the world that is clearly in the cockpit of global history, as you might say. Now, historically, when we look at uh, what drives power formation in regions, uh, you know, we look obviously at, at demographics, at economic size, uh, military uh, uh, weight, and so forth. And I will start, of course, here with the demographics. Um, now, what's interesting about this is not only a, a picture that's worth a lot more than a thousand words, quite frankly, when you think about the, the implications of this, because it's not only a statement for today that the majority of the world's population lives in this, uh, in this, um, in this circle, but that it will always be true for everyone's life, everyone in this room, your children, your grandchildren, for the rest of the future of humanity, that will be true because the world population is not rising to 15 billion people the way demographers feared um, in, the, uh, in the 1990s. Instead, our world population will probably not even reach 10 billion people. And in that world, Asia will have at least 5 billion of them. Right. So the mere fact, of course, of demographic weight alone doesn't confer uh, power. Uh, I, I devoted the book Connectography to explaining that your geography doesn't change, it's your degree of connectivity that changes, and that's what determines your, your power and relevance in the system. And what is happening now is that Asia is not only the demographic center of the world, but is also getting more internally connected, which is to say it's becoming ever more of a system. Now, when we look at Asia's story, and particularly its economic uh, and, and geopolitical rise since the uh, end of World War II, we tend to color it, especially today when we're talking about trade wars and so forth, we, we, we think about global economics, geoeconomics, and these 
binary terms and zero-sum terms of competition between nations. But I want to remind everyone that the story of Asia's collective rise is not the story of competing blocks within the region, but rather the story of mutually reinforcing waves. And the first wave, of course, is Japan. Uh, which in the post-war decades rose to become the world's second largest economy in a very short period of time. And the Japanese economic miracle, of course, was the inspiration for the modernization and industrialization of the tiger economies that came thereafter. And this year, of course, we are, uh, many people are looking back on, and in China, they're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the beginning of the reform era, the establishment of uh, Shenzhen as the country's first special economic zone. And who were the largest investors in China? in those early years and decades. Right? It was, of course, Japan and the Tigers, who today are still among the largest investors in China. So you see the mutually reinforcing waves every couple of decades of one set of Asian nations that have risen, investing in and stimulating the development of the next set. So the problem now is that we live in this sort of ahistorical mindset today, where everything is about China, China, China. You know, and some people probably expected me to write a book called The Future is China, but I didn't. The book is called The Future is Asia. <laughs> because there are five billion people, as I said earlier, in Asia, only uh, 1.5 billion of whom are Chinese. That leaves several billion who are not Chinese, uh, by my arithmetic, and they exist. Surprise, surprise. It's just that most books about, uh, about, about Asia, you know, focus very much on China, and I tried to offer a very macro corrective to this, especially because if you look, the further you look ahead, the more you see that if Asia is rediscovering that historical connectivity and systemness as far west as the Persian Gulf region, which people don't think of as Asia, we think of it as the so-called Middle East, though no such term exists in geography, right? Uh, it's in fact West Asia. So that's the definition of Asia that I'm taking, and that definition is not used in books about Asia in geopolitics. So I wanted to bring it back. And that brings us to the next wave, of course, because history doesn't begin or end with China today. Now, if you look at this next wave of Asian growth, right, uh, the South and Southeast Asian countries, the, the stretch from Pakistan through India, uh, through uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar, ASEAN, all the way to the Philippines, that's two and a half billion people right there. Younger populations than China, in many cases, faster growing economies. India is already growing faster than China. Some of the fastest growing countries in the world are in that stretch of countries, whether it's um, uh, you know, Bangladesh uh, and, and others. And you see a lot of investment now being diverted from China, given the lower wages, into, into this stretch of countries. So if you take um, here, South and Southeast Asia, the two and a half billion people, and if they grow at 5%, if their economies grow at only 5%, mind you, India is growing faster than that already, but then they will equal China's present GDP in just 10 years. Right? In just 10 years. 10 years is a blink of an eye, really. And yet, they don't get talked about right, in the global geoeconomic and strategic conversation. Not much. Right? It's all very China-centric. But China is really a midpoint in this story. It's not the beginning or the end of how to understand Asia. And this is extremely important to, for people, anyone really, whether you're in Singapore, uh, who may intuitively grasp this because we're not in China, or certainly if you're in the West because we oversimplify too much. You know, if you go to, the, go to many places in, um, in the US, UK, or elsewhere, Asia is China, China plus, whatever China wants, right? But that's not the emerging uh, reality. I'm going to get into that. Now, economically, uh, if, you, if you look at Asia not in an, uh, dollar uh, real terms, but rather in PPP terms, you see that Asia is not only a, a obviously very large cluster of economies, but that in PPP terms, a number of them are, are far larger than, than they get credit for. China still remains the largest economy in Asia and very much the largest economy in the world already. But India gains tremendously from measuring its economy in PPP terms. If you take ASEAN economies together, they're larger than India. Right, and I think ASEAN should be appreciated as an economic uh, region, and it's uh, with only half the population of India as a larger GDP, with less than less than half the population of China as well, attracts more FDI than China does. So Asia should be thought of as a, again a, an economically multipolar region uh, as well, and it's been integrating over the last 20, 25 years. Um, you know, it's if you think about the collapse of the Soviet Union and the aftermath. Um, uh, of that, one of the first 
sort of seminal economic trends was the super cycle, right? The, the, the correspondence of high commodities prices with high demand. Um, so commodities being oil and gas being provided by West Asia, again, the Persian Gulf countries in, in pink, uh, purple here, and the high demand of East Asia. So the Indian Ocean displaced the Atlantic Ocean as the center of global goods and commodities trade, which is very much the case today. What I've done in this, uh, with this data is I went back uh, 15 years, 10 years, five years, and the present, and here is the present. If you take any dyad, any pair of uh, Asian sub-regions or countries and look at their trade volumes uh, with each other across this vast distance, you will see a, a pretty uh, astounding uh, amount of growth. Different rates of growth in some cases where economies are proximate and not complementary, obviously they're, they're not going to have as much trade with each other. Uh, uh, South Asia as a region, India and its neighbors are, are obviously not very well integrated. But generally speaking, the pattern across the region holds. And these, these are astounding figures. Now this is so significant because I'm not just talking about um, you know, Asia, it, understanding Asian economics for its own sake. If you don't understand this, and if you didn't know this going into the trade war, which obviously the White House didn't, you would, you would stand to have made some very, 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 very big mistakes. Because if you add up just some of the numbers here, you quickly realize that Asians trade more with each other than they do with the rest of the world. And that's not only true today, that's actually been true for about almost 15 years. That's how far behind the reality most of our conversations are if you turn on CNBC, because they make it sound, not to pick on them, oh, they're all the same, they're all guilty of the same uh, intellectual offenses. Um, being way behind the reality that China's number one trading partners are other Asians. And its second largest trading partners, I'll jump ahead, are, um, wait, sorry, I, here, are, is Europe, right? So America is actually the third most important trading partner seen from Beijing, right? And much of what America sells to China, commodities, agricultural goods, uh, um, industrial goods, and so forth, can be substituted by others. And right now what's happening with the trade war is that obviously some sectors in China are feeling a temporary pinch, export controls diminish uh, access to certain vital technologies, but most of those technologies, um, you know, semiconductors and, and so forth, um, are, are available from others. You know, that's why Japan, South Korea, and China have decided to further liberalize their trade. That's why RCEP is moving forward. That's why Europe is trying to have more FTAs uh, with Asia as well, with Japan, um, uh, with ASEAN, with India. So whereas the US has not signed TPP, and has in many ways created a, a tariff cycle that is uh, eventually going to uh, further diminish its presence and, and, and uh, in, in Asian markets, others are moving in to fill the gap, namely other Asians and Europe, which again together represent the two largest shares of global trade, far larger than, than North America does. Now, if you're in the United States, let's remember that not having a high trade to GDP ratio is a good thing. Right, geopolitically, it means you have self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is uh, a holy grail in geopolitics. It's something that, that all power, power, powers aspire to. It's the origin of geopolitical thinking is actually the quest for geographical self-sufficiency over your commodities and agricultural supply within a given uh, longitude, right? So that, that's, that's, uh, that's something that actually North America has achieved. So what's great geopolitically, though, may not be great geoeconomically. You may be massively overestimating your leverage in trade over the rest of the world, which has gone ahead and is trading with itself. And that's part of what's going on. I'll just make a couple more points. The Asianization of Asia, as I call it, is uh, a process that, again, began in the 1990s with the super cycle. It's found its way through the trade integration um, of the post-Asian financial crisis period, such that by the time of 2008, the, uh, the financial crisis that emanated out of New York, again, there was already a sufficient integration that there was resilience to the demand shocks of the financial crisis. And then th beyond that, uh, more uh, financial and trade integration has taken place, and now you have the final piece of the puzzle, which is the sort of Belt and Road Initiative and the infrastructural integration that not only brings Asians closer together, but brings Europe into the, into the fold. So you have a process of decoupling, as you would call it, um, not just Asian decoupling, but perhaps Eurasian decoupling. And I think that's a very healthy process of these countries that, again, together represent now not just five, but really together six billion people, if you extend to, to Europe uh, and, the, and the Arab world. Um, 
that are finding ways to, again, because the colonial barriers and the Cold War barriers are no longer there, they're able to, to exercise uh, this. And there's also the diplomatic component that complements that, which is to say that there's an Asian-centric set of institutions. In conversations about world order and global governance, we've so often focused on whether or not Asians are gaining voice and vote in Western institutions. But most people don't focus on the fact that, that what's equally, if not more important, is that Asians are building their own institutions. Um, and, that, and here I've created a Venn diagram where you see some of those. And what's critical here is that um, you know, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is, um, is now obviously a, a more important story in terms of uh, uh, trade liberalization than uh, TPP, though TPP is moving forward without the US. And on the left, you have the AIIB, which is probably the fastest growing multilateral institution in, in history with you know, 80 plus members, um, you know, extending all the way to very non-contiguous places. I think I have to add Chile and Iceland, if I'm not mistaken. Chile and Iceland have decided to join the AIIB. They, they don't um, fit the word, the description Asian, but you can clearly see uh, what, <laughs> what a popular mandate uh, the organization has. So I'm gonna make a couple of points now about this just to, just to wrap up, um, which is that I expect despite um, a lot of media, you know, pointing to Belt and Road backlash and anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, again, I've, I've been there. You know, I, I spend a lot of time in the places like Mongolia and Myanmar and Kazakhstan um, where you, and, uh, and Pakistan where you're starting to see anti-Chinese uh, uh, rumblings. That doesn't mean that infrastructure is not going to get built, right? Or, or, you know, or, or it'll be financed by someone, if not by China. There are renegotiation of terms and all sorts of uh, uh, things. But the infrastructure is direly necessary if you think about a set of post-colonial and post-Soviet countries whose populations have doubled or tripled in the past uh, 50, 60 years with very little um, new infrastructure finance. But here's the final point, and this is, this is the, one of the central arguments in the book and a counterintuitive one. Right now when people talk about Belt and Road, they view it as a Chinese hegemonic plot, uh, and there's a linear pathway between building infrastructure for a country and basically buying that country and buying influence there. That's not how history actually works, and that's not how imperial cycles work. When an empire uh, extends its largesse um, and, uh, and, and tries to purchase the loyalty of allies, uh, or of, sorry, of clients and colonies through infrastructure investment and so forth, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bought eternal goodwill and, uh, and control over those economies. What happens in the long term, and if you look obviously just at European history, it's that you accelerate those countries and markets gaining the confidence uh, to eventually to grow, to modernize, to diversify, um, to, to receive sovereign debt ratings, uh, to, to credit ratings, to attract investment, and to ultimately dilute, dilute the share that China controls in their economies. And if it were the case that you know, um, empires extending their influence through infrastructure meant that they were eternally in control of those countries, then India would still be under British rule. Right? So there is actually a cycle of history. And one of the things I point out in the book is that what it took European empires um, 300 years of experience to learn, China is learning in about three years because it's different conditions than the 18th and 19th centuries, right? You have sovereignty, you have transparency, you have democracy, you have a lot of scrutiny over Chinese projects and finance. Countries, in other words, can say no. Options that were not on the table for uh, African colonies and Asian colonies in the, uh, in the 18th century are on, very much on the table today, which is why I'm just going to jump through. If you look at some key countries that are participants in Belt and Road, you cannot find one discernible pattern by which you would say clearly that, that uh, you know, all countries are being bought off by China and China is using infrastructure and investment as a pathway to dominance. You actually see a lot of countries where this backlash has already kicked in and China is being forced to take haircuts on debt, to renegotiate, to share uh, financial goals, to, and, and, and so on. And I'm seeing that everywhere. And let me just close with the example of, uh, of Sri Lanka and Hambantota port because that's the one that everyone cites. People s look at the, um, the debt for equity swap by which uh, Sri Lanka to avoid a default handed a 99 year lease over Hambantota port to, um, uh, to China as an example of how there's a linear pathway from uh, China investing or lending somewhere to it taking over. But what it's really caused is a significant uh, domestic um, uh, you know, consternation and, and flip-flops in government and so forth, such that it's not likely that China will get to use that port for its intended purposes. And more importantly, every other country in the region 
Uh, the day after that happened, their cabinets must have gotten together and said, hmm, what can we do to avoid being like Sri Lanka? So whereas most analysts and commentators and news look at you know, the, uh, the Hamantota situation and say, well, here's China going like this. It's going to you know, take over Asia now and there's going to be just dominoes of debt for equity swaps. In fact, I think Sri Lanka will be the one and only one because everyone woke up the next morning and said, we don't want to be the next Sri Lanka. Right? So geopolitics is nonlinear, Belt and Road is nonlinear, history is nonlinear. Um, and what we'll see is, in fact, Belt and Road, to cut, get to the point, uh, actually accelerate the return of what Asia has mostly been for centuries, which is a multipolar zone. Right? Not, not a, a, in Asian history, there's only one time when the full Asian geography was properly under the control of one power, and that's obviously the Mongol era. And that was a very long time ago in a fairly exceptional situation. I don't really think of China as the new Mongols. I think there's all sorts of forces that militate against the idea of Chinese unipolarity in Asia. Asia's natural state, given the richness and diversity of its civilizations, is multipolarity um, and, and, in a way, a, a respectful autonomy um, uh, across the vast distances uh, of Asia. A lot of people characterize China as an unstoppable force, and I believe that Asia is full of immovable objects, in a way. And I think that what we will find, ultimately, is an equilibrium. And Asia, again, most of Asian history is the history, a story, if you will, of equilibrium among these great um, uh, civilizations. And I expect that to continue, though there will obviously be many bumps along the way. And I'm sure we're going to talk about those. So that's just a very, very tiny uh, preview of the book. And again, I really want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the school for being so immensely uh, supportive to uh, Kishore and to Yanfeng as well for your uh, support and presence. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Parag. That was fascinating. You've given us a lot of uh, uh, things to reflect on. I'm going to just briefly introduce our chief commentator, uh, Professor Yun Fung Kong. And all I want to say is that when I was the dean, the hardest job uh, as a dean is to try and invite world-class top scholars to come and teach in your school. And I can tell you that one of the biggest catches we ever had was Professor Yun Fung Kong, who was uh, uh, teaching uh, first in Harvard when I met him, and then in Oxford. And if you do any kind of Google searches and uh, for citations and all, you'll find his name comes up uh, all the time. So Yun Fung, over to you, and then we will have a panel discussion here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kishore, that, for that most uh, generous uh, introduction. And I'm not sure if I'm able to live up uh, you know, to your uh, kind comments. Um, but I'm delighted to be here. And I think uh, most of you here, like me, after listening to Parag's uh, magisterial summary uh, of his uh, new book, will probably agree that he has written an important and timely book. It is also, in my view, a book that bucks the current trend, which tends to take a pessimistic to alarmist view about Asia's future. I'll come back to this point uh, later. But first, heads off to you, Parag, for coming up with such a provocative uh, and must-buy title. Because if you imagine seeing the book on the shelves in a Kino, you know, uh, in a, a WHS in London, um, or in the airport, uh, and if you are a book buying kind of a person, the book says you know uh, the future is Asia, right? And if you you know you if you agree with him, you say, hmm, I'll fork out US thirty bucks, you know, to see you know how he uh, argues it in in a way that confirms my sensibilities. On the other hand, if you are an American firster who disagrees vehemently with Barat's thesis you might also want to fork out 30 bucks to see how Barack gets it so wrong. Right? <laughs> Either way, he will be smiling all the way to the bank. Right? <laughs> so congratulations on the title. Now... <laughs> oh, I see, all right. <laughs> uh, now, my, more seriously, I believe the book makes a significant contribution to our understanding of Asia's economic and political trajectory by bringing to bear Parag's encyclopedic knowledge of the most critical developments central to, 
the making of what he calls the Asian century. One of my favorite lines from the book is uh, in Parag's own words. He says, if the 19th century featured the Europeanization of the world and the 20th century, the Americanization, then the 21st century is the time of Asianization. And citing developments from China's Belt and Road Initiative, which he just uh, you know, uh, regaled us about, which he called the most significant diplomatic project of the 21st century. All right, to Singapore's successful technocratic approach, uh, which Barack says is what the LKY school was also created to partly propagate, uh, to Indian, South Korean, and Japanese soft power expressed through uh, captivating movies, uh, prize-winning novels, and scientific achievements. These are all developments that prove that it will be Asian ideas, ways of doing things, and personalities that will have a decisive role in shaping the new and basically happy order. I hope I read you correctly up to that point. Early in the book, Parak also takes a bow in Kishore's direction while doing a playful twist on Kishore's Can Asians Think book. When Parak quips, and I quote him, it is time to explore not if Asians can think, but what they think. Uh, so to earn my uh, keep uh, and perhaps to help generate uh, a discussion, I will, take this, I will take up this ammunition to examine what Asians think and do and perhaps uh, point to uh, some issues uh, that uh, the book may not have addressed uh, fully. Uh, in a sense, I'm interested in uh, digging a little bit into the more seamy side of uh, you know, what Asians think and do. Reading the book, two questions occurred to me. First, what if our examination of what Asians have been thinking and doing suggests a more disunited and fractious group of nation states? From nuclear proliferation in the Korean Peninsula to tense South Korean-Japan relations, tense China-Taiwan relations, to the China-Japan competition in our region, not to mention the maritime disputes in the South China Sea, or even the recent downturn in Malaysia-Singapore relations. Uh, Asians seem more divided by issues of historical legacy as well as geopolitical competition than being united on a civilizational basis. Some of these contests can easily spiral out of control, result in military crisis and perhaps even conflict. In other words, might Asia's future be less rosy than portrayed in the book. Uh, second, on top of the intra-Asian contests and flashpoints I've just mentioned, how do we layer in the United States? I'm a student of uh, US foreign policy, so the US is always very much at the top of uh, my mind. Leaving aside the question of whether the US thinks of itself as an Asian power, I wonder if the book gives uh, insufficient attention to the power transition, uh, when we talk about power shifting from uh, west to east, that many people uh, are talking about. The picture here is one where US hegemony, being the predominant power, is waning, with China as the obvious rising power and peer competitor challenger. The history of the last 500 years, Graham Allison reminds us, suggests that 12 out of 16 such power transitions resulted in a major war to settle the issue of who is number one. The book uh, by Parag anticipated this history recurring issue um, and by saying that history does not repeat itself or even rhymes. Uh, and I think that's a very wise position to take. But historians have found a pattern of how power transitions occur and it seems to me that you know, the burden of proof is on those who believe that we can escape this logic. What has changed, I would like to ask, uh, in the way that states seek power and status that is different today compared to, say, the first half of the 20th century? So these are just uh, two of the many stimulating questions that the book provoked in me. Uh, with that, I'll hand the stage over back to the chair. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, we have about another 40 minutes or so. We will spend about 10 minutes or so discussing on the panel, then uh, 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll throw the floor open uh, for questions. I hope you will be get ready your your questions. I'm sure you'll have many for Barack. So Barack, why don't you begin by, in a sense, perhaps answering the first very question, very important question that Yun Fung raised. Everybody around the world looks at Asia and sees this very fractious, divided, uh, distrustful Asia. How do you tell them, this, the skeptics, that the, despite all these, uh, you know, divisions, distrust, and all that, there's still a happy future mm -hmm. for Asia? How sure. do you how do you respond to those uh, critics? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily posit a happy future uh, mm. for Asia. Actually, part of the logic is, is counterintuitive, and that, that I that I sort of explain at length when I'm looking at Asian history and, and the, the implications of thinking about Asia's future mm -hmm. from the standpoint of Asian history rather from the standpoint of Western history. Because in Europe's claustrophobic space where most of the power transition models you know, historically come from, you have the prospects of a single power being able to truly uh, subsume and dominate the others and impose in a way upon them in a permanent way and there are sufficient cultural commonalities that that hegemony could in fact be sustainable. But in Asia that's never been possible precisely because it is completely disunified because it is far more diverse than any other part of the world because you have such mutually incomprehensible civilizations of across a much larger space. So it is precisely the disunity of Asia that is inherent in Asia the diversity in Asia that is the reason why when you want to understand the future of Asia one shouldn't look at it from the standpoint of powers of um, you know equal size and importance sharing a single territory and competing over that territory Asia in many ways is the opposite set of conditions and therefore it doesn't have to be a happy picture it's a deferential picture it's Chinese saying well how what's the point of conquering India they're not Chinese, they can't become Chinese, they're never going to become like us, they're never going to learn our language, right? In European history, of course, when powers conquer each other, you have to change the language you speak, right? That, that's not going to happen in Asia, right, ever. Um, so I think we have to look at, again, Asia's past to determine its future. When it comes to power transitions, again, the European template is not particularly useful for a global template, right? Because also you have a multipolar system in ways that you didn't really have before in a, on a global level. You don't have a power at the center that's capable of dictating to all the others with which other regions they can and cannot do business with, right? So our notion of power transitions is not only sort of theoretically sort of uh, uh, askance, but it's also uh, mostly informed by just the last power transition. The notion that um, you know, the, the UK to US transition must immediately be followed by a passing of the baton, you know, peacefully or conflictually, to another single global dominant power. But that's neither the global historical norm, nor, in, in, nor is it a necessity today. Um, that there is a number one, and it's exactly your point of departure, who is number one? I never ask the question, who is number one? My, my answer to that question is, there is not going to be a number one. And it's far more likely, it's far more often the case in history, and it's far more likely the case for the future, that you will not have a number one, because we live in a multipolar world. Even as China rises, it doesn't mean that America will cease to be a global power, which it very much is. It does not mean that the European Union is not a major economic and normative and, and, and in many ways a globally influential player. And not only is there global multipolarity, to get back to the point about Asia, there is Asian multipolarity, right? Because we already see the rise of India, we see the, the growing um, sort of resourcefulness of ASEAN, we see Russia as, an Asian, as again, an increasingly Asian and Asian-leaning power. So again, Asia is full of significant powers. Asia is itself multipolar, even though there's a hierarchy within it. So in, in no way does it comport with reality that China is going to, whether by conflict or, or otherwise, mm -hmm displace America as a singular global power and achieve global hegemony. It, there, there's, there's zero, to my mind, prospect of that happening. That people oversimplify based on faulty historical and faulty cultural logic is what needs to be overcome and explained, and that's what I try to do. Mm. Thank you. So, um, Yun Fung, you re your second question was about the role of the United States, and I think uh, Parag has already uh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. touched on it. What, what's your own view about how, how do you think the United States will react 
oh. to this vision. Okay, uh, Especially two, of a multipolar world. Two points. I think uh, on the issue of polarity, I guess my uh, perspective uh, is slightly different from Parag's because uh, it is, uh, I think w one of the interesting things in the book is that Parag uh, writes about a multipolar Asia. Right? Um, we look at the same thing, but actually we come to very different uh, uh, conclusions. I look at it all right, today and I see it being increasingly bipolar. Uh, and uh, I think I've been partly influenced by this wonderful uh, measure of uh, you know, uh, Asian power by the Lowy Institute of Australia back in May 2018. It's a fascinating uh, approach to measuring power where they look at eight major indicators of power, including soft power. And the conclusion is that in Asia today, there are two leading powers that are way ahead of all the others, and they are the US and China. All right, with Japan being uh, number three, Russia being number four, Singapore being number six or seven. So based on their measures... And I mean, India? Uh, India is probably number five, uh, six. Mm. So uh, if you accept that study, and it's probably the most uh, rigorous uh, and thought out uh, uh, measure of uh, power I've seen, there are many, many measures, but the, uh, this particular one called the Asian Power Index is one of the most uh, you know, uh, sort of comprehensive and thoughtful. Uh, there are problems, but, by, you know, uh, but if you accept that, it means that uh, Asia today has two major powers. And everything that I see happening between the US and China suggests to me that the geopolitical competition is going on. And it is about who is number one. But on this, I think it's fair for us, um, you know, uh, if we have different perspectives, I mean, uh, that's, uh, you know. One of the uncommon. things I point out is that, you know, America is a Pacific power, not an Asian power. Mm -hmm. It's a Pacific power with very significant interests mm -hmm. and, and positions in Asia. But to not be geographically Asian means that in many ways your interests are subject to negotiation. Mm -hmm. And we see that happening all the time. We see that happening with mm -hmm. tensions in, in the alliances. It doesn't mean, even with tensions over economic affairs or even you know, cultural issues and obviously strategic burden sharing, all of these debates, obviously there's no question that the US South Korean and US American, US Australian and other uh, alliances, to the extent that we still use that term you know, meaningfully, um, are, are still intact yes. fundamentally just based on um, you know, the law of enemy of my enemy sort of thing. But you know, those of us, whether um, you know, Americans or, or certainly those in Asia, you know, are questioning the durability of that commitment given the, the resource stress that the United States is under, mm -hmm. the debates in the U.S. about the extent to which it wants to remain so committed. What uh, you know, cost is it willing to bear to defend uh, those allies? And, uh, and, and of course, what are its own allies thinking in calculating as well as they practice not direct, not exclusive alliances, but multi-alignment, where they begin to negotiate and to form you know, uh, uh, marriages of convenience and relationships of convenience in, in all directions, not just with uh, the United States. So I think we have to view the strategic environment is far more fluid than bipolar. It's bipolar when you're looking strictly at these kinds of power concentration indices. And I'll be honest with you, the Lowy one I don't think is particularly good. I don't think any of the mm -hmm. ones out there are particularly good because I don't think, I don't believe in the term soft power. I think it's actually very silly. And, uh, and, and to be honest with you, here's one of the things that everyone should be aware of. Um, China's likability, favorability, uh, is in direct uh, inverse proportion to the amount that it invests in a country, right? The more China invests in a country, the less people like it. Uh, I think that that is mentioned somewhere in the report. If it's not, that's another reason why it's not a very good report. But for those of us who have been studying the minutia of power concentration indices since, since I was 17 years old uh, and looking at, you know, the extent to which these methodologies bias towards the number of nuclear weapons a country has, or its military size, or its trade relationships, or these things like soft power. There's, there's flaws so fatal in all of them that they're not really worth using. It's much more interesting to look at reality, right, rather than these abstract uh, representations. And in reality, we have a very fluid environment where, uh, you know, Asians are uh, certainly leaning on the U.S. still in many ways, uh, and, and as well they should, so long as the U.S. is still willing to offer that support. It's a smart idea. But the interesting story that I try to tell is all of the many cross-cutting 
and very fluid alliance dynamics. I wouldn't even call them alliances, whether it's the Quad Agreement, whether it is the ways in which military resources and exercises are now being conducted by second tier powers among each other, and so forth. And that, to me, constitutes a return to some of the practices that, that you've certainly documented that I write about in the historical chapter. This is some the ga games that Asians have been playing for many, many centuries, actually. You know, and they don't view, in a way, China's rise as the same all or nothing proposition the way the United States does. Let me just come back quickly uh, on uh, uh, the Low Institute. Uh, soft power is just one right. of the uh, eight indicators that they try to measure. The reason why I believe that that is a very uh, instructive study is because no one has dared to measure it and then incorporate it into a single number. Uh, so the Low Institute takes the, is the first group of thinkers uh, to do that. All right, and anyone who disagrees with them, because normally political scientists have just used uh, GNP, uh, you know, and uh, steel and uh, co-production, but they have gone further than most. And so, if you disagree with those statistics, uh, that, that measures, I think uh, you are incumbent to come up with your own to show that you know the distribution is uh, power is not as what the uh, 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 Asian Power Index says. Secondly, on the point of uh, America's uh, fear about China's rise, uh, that's a very interesting, uh, all of you would have heard of Graham Allison and the Thucydides trap, right, which I mentioned uh, in my uh, remarks. Now, before the book came out a few years, Graham Allison and Robert Blackwell of the Kennedy interviewed the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, all right, and they asked uh, Mr. Lee a very simple question. Do you think that China would want to displace America as the number one power in Asia or the world? And Mr. Lee's answer was, of course, why not? All right, they have lifted 700 million people from poverty, all right, and they feel that this is their right, all right. But for the purposes of this century, what China is interested, according to Mr. Lee, is to be a co equal power with the US. The assumption being that China can wait until the next century to take over. So this is a really, really long term projection. The problem, of course, is. It's unlikely, in my view, that the U.S. will grant the co-equality that China desires, mainly because China is perceived by the U.S. as a non-democracy. That is a big stickler. And for that, China will try to compete with the U.S., based on my understanding of international politics, to force facts on the ground until all right, the hegemon recognizes that uh, China is its co-equal. Yeah, since, since we are discussing U.S.-China relations, I'm going to inject a small <laughs> commercial break in the discussions <laughs> <laughs> and mention to you all that the February issue of Harper's Magazine, which is an American magazine, actually has come out with a cover story on uh, U.S.-China relations. The title is What China Threat? The Future of U.S.-China Relations. The author is Kishore Mabubani, not a bad author. <laughs> So anyway, it, 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 it comes. Well. Huh? It is a book that you're. No, no, it, it's also it's, um, it's also part of a book I'm working on. I hope to finish. I, I can't write as fast as Parag, <laughs> uh, but I hope to finish the, finish a book on U.S. Uh, China relations uh, by by June this year. I've submitted my publisher, Public Affairs in New York. But clearly, I think one thing that you can hear from this discussion is that uh, everybody around the world is frankly talking about what's going to happen in the relationship between the United States and China. And it's a very complex relationship. There are many different dimensions to it. There's the economic dimension, the political dimension, the military dimension, then the cultural dimension, I think, is also uh, very important. And then you also have uh, what, what I think you referred to, both of you, the primacy di dimension. Uh, who's number one, who's number two, that's also at play uh, in this thing. So it's a very, it's a very, it's a very complex uh, topic and that's why it's actually very good uh, to have discussions like the one we are having now in this panel with different points of view because nobody, nobody for sure has the 100% correct answers uh, on what's going to happen. Let I think me just add one, one point. I find myself in a very curious position because many people in the U.S. view me as an apologist for China. <laughs> and here I, I've gone, you know, not out of my way, it's, it's what I actually think. And it's uh, obviously, it seems to be the opposite perspective in some ways from someone who would be an apologist mm. for China and pro-Chinese and believing that this co-equality, if it were to ever uh, you know, transpire, would be a good thing and, you know, mm. and so forth. It, it's to me a fairly objective uh, analysis mm. of the situation. But the point I'm making is that just because an, a power wants something, it doesn't mean it gets it. 
I served in Iraq and Afghanistan in the United States military. So I know very well that just because a superpower wants something, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's going to get it, right? And so with China, you know, they surely want Belt and Road to succeed and everyone to just shut up and take the money and build the ports. Mm -hmm. But that's just not the way reality seems to be playing out, is it? Mm -hmm. So let's again look at more reality. I love theory as much as you do. We're both theorists, right? But uh, at the end of the day, reality seems to have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see more and more of this. Um, Again, I don't like to call it backlash. I like to call it just adjustment because mm -hmm. Belt and Road is fundamentally an, a, a brilliant idea. I've been writing mm -hmm. about the market failure in infrastructure finance for a long time. It's existed for decades. Belt and Road fills it. And I mm -hmm. think it's a very, uh, in a way, noble initiative. But it's not going to necessarily play out in a way that privileges its sponsor. Um, and I think, again, that's how history works. I remember every, you cited in your Harper's essay Bill Clinton's uh, speech at mm. Yale uh, mm. 20 years ago where he said that you, know, you must embed China in institutions and, mm. and so forth. Well, I mean, institutions are the ways in which, by joining them, you dilute uh, mm. their, their, the, the original sort of uh, organizations that created them. And that's what you see happening in the World Bank, IMF, and elsewhere. And if the United States really wants to shape Chinese behavior, it would actually join the Belt and Road. Mm. It would join the Asian Bank, right, Infrastructure Bank. It would actually contest how, how uh, funding is done, what, what yeah. standards, what contracts, and so on. And that's how you shape the behavior. Good. I'm sure we'll persuade Donald Trump to do so tomorrow. Yeah, hard, uh, <laughs> maybe not. Now, I need a, okay. I need a reality check, because uh, that's not going to happen. OK. Uh, OK, we have another 25 minutes. So please, questions uh, from the floor. I have no doubt that uh, there are many. Yeah. Who's coming to the mic? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. If Thank you don't you. mind, briefly introduce yourself. We all yeah. know. Okay. Uh, yeah. You and the panel know you well, but they tell the audience who you are. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank you, for our founding dean, Kishore. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a graduate uh, of our Lee Kuan School. I'm from China. Yeah. But uh, I'm not going to ask a question about China because you talked too much about China. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, congratulations on your new book. Doctor, yeah. if I'm not wrong, you describe uh, the Asia's rise as a whole of the region, right? Spanning from Middle East to Russia, Australia. However, in reality, you know, Asia is connected economically, but it's not uh, united politically. So I think the reason is not uh, because we Asians are so different, so diverse. The reason is that, is that we can't reach certain consensus over certain values, such as human rights, the rule of law, and the democracy. So my question is that, do, do you think those values and the consensus is very important for Asia's future? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And um, you know, I have a section of the book about what I call the new, the new Asian values. And um, you know, obviously, it's a reflection on, on the Asian values debate that, that took place decades ago. And Kishore and others were obviously active leading participants in it. And, I, and obviously, that conversation, you know, in, in, in the course of things, you know, faded, faded into the background with the Asian financial crisis and so forth. So I set myself the task of trying to answer what would be a new set of Asian values today that, you know, five billion people, Arabs, Turks, Russians, uh, Japanese, Chinese, Thais, uh, you know, Indians might loosely subscribe to, not in a coordinated way. Um, and, and that was a big struggle, probably one of the hardest parts of the book to write. And I came up with, with three things, uh, just three in honor of Kishore. Um, <laughs> num number one was um, you know, uh, a, 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 pre a preference, if you will, for technocratic forms of governance, even in the democracies. Even in, in, in Asia has more, de more people living in democracy than the whole rest of the world. Let's remember that. In the next six months, there are 1.8 billion Asians who are going to participate in elections, right? In India, Indonesia, and the Philippines not to mention, of course, the other democracies uh, in the region. So, but despite that, there is a, a, a deference, if you will, towards uh, executive authority you know, with long-term mandates, if you will, around national leadership, reform, and, and, and so forth. More so than there is in the West, obviously, where governments change every five minutes. Um, in some cases, we wish they would, but, but they don't. Uh, uh, so there's, there's that. The second was uh, mixed capitalism, right? Obviously, a, a, a tolerance, if not a preference, again, for a strong role for the state in the economy, whether it's uh, through industrial uh, policies, sub you know, subsidies, and other kinds of supports uh, for critical industries, picking winners, managed innovation, whatever the case uh, may be. And the third was what I call uh, social conservatism. Obviously, none of these things are universally shared 
across Asia, right? But if I describe the characteristics of a society in which there is a, you know, a growing sense of liberty and freedom, but a caution towards how rapidly that's into implemented uh, across the spectrum of issues, whether it is media freedom or LGBT rights or whatever the case may be, there's a sense that people will say, yes, it's okay if we do those things, I suppose, but let's have it be done in an incremental and somewhat managed way so that things don't get out of control, right? So these are soft things, but I came up with these three, and that's what I call the new Asian values. And I obviously describe them, discuss them in much more length with examples uh, in the book. But I, I put that out there to stimulate the conversation because I haven't heard people talking about Asian values, obviously, in a good 10 or 15 years. Great. Now, I can, as usual, there are lots of questions and uh, time is passing. So can we have short, sharp questions and maybe short, sharp replies yep. and <laughs> then we can get your, all, the, all the five questioners in so far. I'll start with a gentleman here, then the lady. Maybe we'll take two at a time. So yep. go ahead. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll limit it to, to two minutes, if that's okay. Um, the only person who asked the most important question was Kishore, and it might be because of his philosophical background, and that is, you know, will the future of Asia be happy? And that's particularly, particularly significant in Singapore, which is one of the least happy nations in the entire world, as Kishore points out in his book um, in 2015. Now, can Singapore survive? And the two of you have, have talked about survival but only Kishore has asked the most important question. Now, what's interesting is that Kishore started out as a pacifist, uh, famously so, and over time modified his views. Singapore did the same. In other words, in 1965, in the UN speech, this country told the UN that it wanted to be a welfare state, not a warfare state. Fast forward to today, and just like Kishore, Singapore has evolved, and now its number one budget item is defense and weapons purchases. So my question is, why haven't more intellectuals made a connection behind, you know, based on this evolution, or devolution, if you, depending on how you look at it, and what is it really, what is it, what is it, what is it going to take before more intellectuals openly call for not only a reduction, not just in nuclear weapons, but all weapons, and a reduction in country-wide uh, and worldwide defense spending, so that we can solve at least this deficit in happiness, which again, Kishore points out, is one of the most important questions. Thank you. Okay, that's mm -hmm. question number one. Question, take the question number two. Yes. Okay, hi. Again, if you don't mind, I, I forgot to ask you to introduce yourself, sorry. Can you just briefly introduce yourself to Parat? Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm Matthew Rafat. I'm just unemployed. I'm traveling the world. This is my third time around the world. I've applied for the LKY MPP program. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very important, yeah. Take note. Duly noted. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a student uh, of this school uh, at the International Affairs Program. My question is to Dr. Parakana. So you mentioned that um, while you were talking about multipolarity, that within Asia, it, there's some kind of hierarchical system. I'd like to ask you what that looks like and whether you think that brings about more stability in, within Asia. Thanks. OK, we, let's start with these two questions first, and then we go on to the OK, I'll then, take the second the one the last three uh, after first. That. Again, you know, it's, there aren't precise measures of this depends on what your methodology is for power and also there's, there's the gradient effects. You know, your power is your, your, your raw static power. Where does it apply? How effective is it? In what, in what uh, situations, right? So I think, again, the theory is not very useful in reality. But clearly, you know, there's, Asia is at least uh, tripolar in the sense that China, Japan, India, you can bring in Australia, South Korea, uh, Russia has quite a few powers. Not all of equal significance or importance. The answer to that just depends on the context you're talking about, whether you're talking about a terrestrial dispute, if you're talking about economic leverage, if you're talking about cultural issues. The answer then varies drastically. But clearly, this is a region with multiple uh, significant powers, right? And that's the only generalization you can make. You cannot generalize about whether or not that power translates into, real, into influence on the ground in a coercive and decisive and sustainable way. You cannot answer that question simply by knowing that a state has power. If you look at Japan, which has been one of the most powerful countries in Asia going back through to the, obviously the early part of the 20th century and remains so today, um, it, it's its power, its wealth, its generosity, its foreign investment, uh, its portfolio, its FDI stock is larger than China's. But does it buy it leverage? Does it buy it influence? In fact, if you look at Japan's, again, generosity, largesse around the world, it doesn't have a coercive impact on anyone, 
right? It can be a, one of the most generous investors in Indonesia, but Indonesia will still give the high-speed rail contract to China, right? And uh, it, Indonesia can be doing lots more trade with, with uh, China as it's doing today, but it's not going to uh, renounce its claims to the South China Sea the way China is trying to force other countries to do, right? So just because a state is powerful numerically or statistically and according to an index, it doesn't mean it tells you a whole lot about reality, right? So again, there, Asia has, has numerous, numerous powers and, and their influence will vary based on the context. Um, on, the, on Matthew's question, I'll just sort of you know, take the first part because um, as with other indices, I don't really buy the happiness research. You know, uh, it, it also is due for some serious, it, it already has had its methodological reckoning if you read the, the literature. And, and even when it applies to Singapore, there's a big difference between the term happy and the term satisfied. And one of the errors that's pointed out in the voluminous now critique of the happiness literature is that the terms aren't even necessarily well translated and explained. But if you ask Singaporeans if they're happy, you may get one set of answers. If you ask them if you're satisfied, you get a different set of answers. And even in any case, the most recent, to the extent these studies matter, and again, my view is they don't, but Singapore seems to be climbing the happiness index anyway. And I leave it to all of you to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> Kishore, are you going to take? Are you going to say something about happiness? If not, can I just jump in? Sure, sure, okay. sure. Uh, just to add on to what Parag has just said, um, happiness is one value that countries, uh, you know, uh, should look to. But I don't think it's their ultimate value. Peace and stability might come before uh, happiness, because uh, if you Oops. are in a situation where uh, you can be easily threatened or taken over by others. Uh, the happiness of your citizens is not going to mean much, right? So, uh, so countries have threat perceptions and they build the uh, deterrent posture that they think is necessary in order to uh, you know, deter uh, potential uh, rivals or you know, um, threats. So in that sense, uh, the military spending uh, by any given country is a function of its threat perceptions for, to protect the values of uh, sovereignty, peace and stability. Happiness may, is relevant, but it probably comes later. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll get a clock. We'll take three questions. We'll go clockwise. One, two, three. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sunit. I'm uh, an international affairs student here at the school. Uh, my question is twofold. Uh, it, first one is very similar to my colleague. Uh, uh, the Louis Institute Power Index discussion was very fascinating, and I just wanted to, uh, because it clearly states that there are two uh, distinctly uh, major powers in Asia, as Prof. Kong pointed out, that is US and China. So what, according to you, would be the sort of metrics that could actually pinpoint the actual reality uh, on ground? Also, uh, then uh, the claim that Asia is actually multipolar, uh, so that brings to mind a question that, say, for example, India, how much influence would a country like India have outside of, say, South Asia and, uh, say, in regions like ASEAN or even East Asia? Mm -hmm. And what, what potential do you see in the future uh, uh, in that scenario, in that case? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question, please. Good evening. My name is Michael Bennett. I'm a graduate student at Tufts University Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. I'm also a U.S. Defense Attaché. So if there's no number one moving forward, how do countries and powers hedge and increase their influence in the world to compete? And secondly, should the United States, in your opinion, be concerned about China's growing influence in the Western Hemisphere? Mm -hmm. So your first question was... Uh, if there's no number one moving forward, uh, how do countries maintain and or grow their spheres of influence? Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Elvin Lee. I'm an AI startup business owner. From the technology point, technology point, uh, if uh, Europeans in the earlier century had the technology superiority and the last century the Americans, if the Asian have technology superiority, Asian can be a bit happier. Um, would that make any difference? What's your thoughts on the impact on technology on the sure. power play? Well, technology is not sort of uh, exogenous okay. to this uh, analysis, right? Technology is part of how powers rise in the first place. It is. China's industrial policy that has allowed it to become 
uh, not only an economic superpower, now a military one uh, as well. So there isn't a separate technology conversation. Technology is part of what we've been talking about all along. The difference is that where if you look at, I think there's a branch of geopolitical theory, leading sector analysis, that specifically looks at technological clusters uh, in, a, in, a, in a given a sort of you know, time horizon and the dominance over those sectors obviously gives, confers geopolitical advantage. If you look at the distribution of um, competence you know, and, uh, and, and strength in the leading sectors of today's uh, economy, um, it's not concentrated in Asia, it's spread everywhere. And the lesson in that is that, again, whereas you can paint a neat picture of Europe controlling technologies during the colonial era and then with the post-industrial revolution that broadening a bit more in, to include the United States enabling Western uh, global dominance, that doesn't mean that those powers are replaced by Asian technological superiority. If there's one force that's far more powerful than any power, it's the law of technological diffusion. It's that these technologies spread more rapidly than any one power can control them, right? AI is everywhere, right? AI is, a lot of people talk about AI as, it's a, as if it's a bipolar uh, arms race between the US and China. That's not true, right? The tools for using AI, for harnessing data are spread everywhere. No one can put the genie in the bottle. If you could put control, the technology diffusion, then America wouldn't be declaring a trade war on China right now. What is its complaint? That its technology has been stolen, right? Theft is one form of diffusion, right? The brains, a brain drain and brain circulation is another form. Joint ventures and um, uh, commercial cooperation is another way in which technology diffuses. You can never stop technological diffusion. And now that China has it, it doesn't mean that it stops with China, just like history doesn't stop with China, which is my point. So technology too, uh, prolif it, 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 technology in a way uh, it accelerates the multipolar story that I'm talking about right now. Um, so that, that's just a short answer. Let me get to, um, you know, actually the other two questions were, were somewhat related. Let me just answer the point about uh, uh, India. Um, now, if you saw Martin Wolf of the Financial Times did a column actually in January 1st, uh, you might have all been hung over or something, so you're forgiven if you didn't read it. Uh, but it was titled, uh, you know, the future may in fact not belong to China. That was literally the title. Uh, in a way, it was exactly my argument, which is that if you look, you know, he's one of the, he didn't use the phrase peak China, but, but some people st are starting to. And again, we live in this moment where we're almost ahistorical and caught up in this China centricity. But China's population is, uh, is about to peak and it's going to begin to decline. It has a massive aging population. I also have a demographic infographic in this book that shows you China does have more young people than any country in the world, right? China has more young people than America has people. So there's no question that, you know, but, but because I go, I go to lengths to point out that China is not fading into irrelevance because it's aging. That's not true. It has a lot of old people, but it still has a lot of young people and it has a lot of industrial robots. So I don't worry about China's ability to, to produce and to continue to dominate industrial sectors and, and so forth uh, to the extent that it, it wants to. In a way, Chinese firms are voluntarily offshoring a lot of labor to take advantage of labor cost arbitrage here in ASEAN and as far as Africa. But the fact is that India's rise is very significant economically, right? Its, its population will be larger than China's. Its military spending is growing. Its infrastructure spending is going. It is it has shifted from the terrestrial mentality of the 90s and 2000s when, when uh, there was a lot of focus on you know, containing and competing with China as a land power towards now investing much more in its navy and seeking to be the kind of protector and, and uh, guardian of the Indian Ocean, which is the kind of more rightful role, more sensible role for India to pursue. So India is not going to compete with China per se in Central Asia and so forth, but in the maritime domain, it will be ever more significant with every passing month, and it's proving that that's the case from as far west as the Persian Gulf, where the majority of the population is in fact Indian, uh, all the way here to this region with the Act East and Look East policy. So I, I think again that, that India in one word, although again, I try to give a thousand reasons why we're not going to live in a, in a Chinese world order you know, for the next a thousand years, but you know, a one-word answer would be India is just one, but there's many other answers as well. Um, so the point about the, the, the United States, although I think your question is, is more rightly generic about any power, what is, what, what, how do powers pursue influence in a multipolar world with no uh, you know, central hegemonic uh, force? Well, A, we tend to believe that without a central hegemon, there'll be no rules, there'll be no, there'll be no uh, order, right? There'll be no common sort of frame. That that's again proven not to be true, right? Because the playbook of the World Trade Organization, for example, which is really the most 
single multilateral body we have in, in the system. You know, it's, it's, it's the only coercive, if you will, the only binding, only, only entity with actual binding, you know, legal authority uh, out there. Um, but that playbook is being borrowed by, by dozens of countries to make trade agreements with each other. So even if the WTO itself were to go away, you would still have the WTOification in a way uh, uh, of the world. And even without the UN Security Council uh, authorizing certain you know, uh, regional peacekeeping operations, regions would simply authorize it themselves and do them. So we live in a world that is regionally, in a way, enfranchised and empowered. And for any one power from one region, like the US, to be influential in Africa, Latin America, Europe, and Asia, first and foremost, it has to be present there. You know, in contrast to the Lowy Institute, and also to answer part of your question, what metrics would I use? Well, actually, that's what I do. I say, let's break down this idea of power and influence into something actually tangible. America has a military presence globally. Where does it matter? How much? How much is it influencing affairs? America has a financial role in the world economy. Very significant, right? To what extent is its currency reserve currency used in trade, providing liquidity and capital for markets around the world? It has a, um, uh, it has a, um, uh, a security role, obviously. You know, military line. So I mil mentioned military finance. Technology. American technology is still very central to its influence. Where is American technology influential, right? Is it software? Is it hardware? Is it industrial goods? Is it social media? What? Let's measure it, right? It has cultural influence, right? In which, which places does the English language, American education, and so forth matter and shape society? So uh, that, that's what I would use, right? I would say, let's look at these variables these factors that are the actual tangible manifestation of American influence and let's go around the world and let's say how much are they working or not working, how much do they matter and not matter. And what America should do uh, to be influential around the world is to use those levers of its influence around the world. If it retreats from a region, it should not be surprised if others move in, right? Now, some of this is just natural. America has energy self-sufficiency to a large degree. So America's uh, oil imports from West Africa have fallen to nearly zero. There's no reason to keep importing oil from Africa if you don't need oil from Africa. So by just logic uh, you know, and, and these forces of, uh, of, of, of the energy discovery that's taken place, you're going to have a less strong US-Africa relationship. And certainly the, the you know, the, the fall of, Amer of uh, imports of African oil has not been replaced by some robust program for, uh, for strengthening ties with Africa, not by any stretch of the imagination. Now, if the US is not going to sign the TPP agreement right, to increase its uh, trade presence in the region, that's going to have a negative impact. It doesn't mean that trade's going to stop. Right? Again, miscalculation, just like I showed you the, the balance of trade relationships. Look at how um, uh, you know, the, the calculation was, if the US doesn't join TPP, it's just going to die. Instead, there was a competition you know, to, to, uh, to make it happen, right? And Canada and Mexico have uh, proportionally same trade deficits with China that the US does. Much smaller volume, but proportionally similar deficits. And their response to having these large deficits with China was not to pull out of TPP, right? It was to say, you know what? We still want more access. We've got to compete in the region. We've got to find ways to open those markets and, and try and uh, innovate and stay ahead. And that's the way Japan looks at it. That's the way South Korea looks at it. So, you know, if you're not connected to a region, if you're not present there, you're not going to have influence there. So the bottom line is be as connected as possible. You're not missed if you're disconnected. It's also the logic of, of you know, that, that failed with Brexit. Remember when Brexit happened, people said, oh, this could be terrible for the world economy. Actually, it's just terrible for Britain, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and this is something that everyone learns the hard way. And this is the most humbling thing to remember in, in a multipolar world is that if you're not at the center, when you're not there, I give, I give, I'm saying this a lot, by the way, with respect to India right now, because the Belt and Road Summit is coming up in, in Beijing in April. Two years ago, Modi decided to boycott for a valid domestic reason, right, uh, in terms of his perception of national interest, which is that, you know, China-Pakistan projects traverse Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, so we're going to boycott. But my, my, what I said to leaders in Delhi, and I'm saying again right now because it's coming up in April and the Indian government has to decide if it's going to uh, attend or not, is if you're not there, no one misses you. No one cares about your opinion if you're not in the tent. Get in the tent, otherwise no one cares what you think or what you're saying. And that is a very blunt way of answering the question. <laughs> okay, quick. I think we have time for one last quick question, please. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, make it short because yes. you have three minutes. Yes. Uh, my name is Divya. I basically work in the insights function. I want to understand what's the role of ASEAN and the future is Asian because you know the way you've broken it down is you know South Asia and Southeast Asia and in this region we all talk about the future of ASEAN and you know what it can do 
So what is your view there? Sure. That's a great place to conclude. I'll give a commercial advertisement for Kishore's last <laughs> book, which as you know was a, a, no, a really splendid history of ASEAN that's cited in, in this book and was very, very instructive for me because also it was written uh, uh, jointly, but yeah. you produced a very literary uh, you know, sort of approach to understanding ASEAN. I, I, I learned people move to Singapore for Singapore, right? Because life here is amazing. But you come to appreciate Southeast Asia and the region, uh, the most blessed corner in the world, as, as Kishore rightly put it. Um, and then you come to appreciate that ASEAN, even though it's one step forward, one step back, one step sideways, no one likes regional diplomacy, it's so boring. Um, but the truth is it does work, right? If you measure again substantively the incremental progress around areas of trade liberalization and uh, you know, uh, labor mobility and all of these things that are happening right now, the infrastructure investments that are happening cross-border, the supply chain harmonization, that's the stuff that no one cares about, no one wants to talk about. But thanks to commercial forces and thanks to ASEAN, it's happening. So I, I, I see a bigger and bigger role for Southeast Asia. Whether ASEAN, the institution, right, is the embodiment or, of that or not is actually secondary. The more important thing is that it facilitates it. And I think it is doing a better job than most people appreciate of facilitating it. Yes, you can see one thing great about being on a panel of fellow authors is that I help him sell his books. He's so happy to sell my books. <laughs> It's a good partnership, right? And you folk, we're going to sell yes. your books okay. too. Yeah. Thank so you. thank you all very much. But remember, thank you. Thank you. please remember the most important part of the evening comes now. <laughs> please go out and buy the book. <laughs> and that's an instruction. <laughs> so thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, thank you Barak. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.